off. We don't have to be as afraid of the satanic things as sometimes people think. Um, they were made in the Adams Family dungeon. Mm. Okay, and then there's this guy. Uh, this one I wanted to show you this, um, just because of the whole incense deal. This is called sensing a church. Now, this is an Orthodox church. This is the priest, and these guys are the assistants, or in the Catholic Church would be a deacon, but there's a different word for the Orthodox Church. The incense is in this thing, which is the censer, or sometimes called a thurible, and it's already burning. You can see the smoke coming out of it a little bit. That's holy smoke. That's holy smoke, yeah. <laughs> Now this guy, I'm just going to point out, this guy has this sash up around his chest rather than his waist. There's some indication that angels in Revelation have their sashes up there like that. So this is supposed to remind us that angels are dressed kind of like that. Okay, now watch how the priest uses the censer to sense the church. Watch this. Now remember, that's got charcoal that's white with ashes and it's got the incense and so forth in it and it's got holes in it so the smoke will come out and in every position he's going to swing it three times watch one two three okay for the trinity one two three okay so he does that and uh, one two three and sometimes if you watch these guys they'll really flip that rascal around <laughs> priest that I worked with in St. Louis used to do a whole thing like this. Yeah. See how the smoke is coming out of it like that? So you can really smell it. See how the smoke is coming up? So there's not a there's not even a sense of let's just let the smoke, let's force the smoke up out of it and the aroma of the incense. In the congregation. Yeah, not a whole lot of people. Well, there don't have to be a lot of people. I don't see any people. Yeah, there's a few of you. Standing on the sides. There's a few in the back pew. And a few in the back. It's a Lutheran church, huh? A lot of times it happens. Now, what happens here is in an Orthodox church, all of these are behind, a lot of this is behind this so-called screen there, uh, as you saw. But I just wanted you to see that this is what happens with, this is what... Um, Incense, this is how you use incense at a church sometimes, is you, uh, you kind of, in a sense, you toss the incense. You know, if you're familiar to Catholic Church, sometimes you use holy water like that. You, know, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. throw the holy water at people, basically. You do the same thing with incense. You basically throw the smoke at them. But you use this thing, this, this thurible, or this sensor and it throws the incense, the smoke at them, and, and the whole point is to bless them with the incense and to pray for them in the incense. You do it three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit while you're doing that. Okay, so that's what the angel is kind of up to um, when he's sensing, he's putting the incense on the, on the altar of incense. Just out of curiosity, what are all the doodads that are just everywhere? No, those are not doodads. There's a lot of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot um, of stuff, boy. Yeah, there's, candles. there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, candle these, holders. Uh, see that, but. These, uh, a lot of these, these are candle holders of various sorts. But these are icons, okay? You know what icons are? This is, a, uh, this is behind the screen. So like in an Orthodox church, like where our communion rail is, there'd be like a screen that goes floor to ceiling almost. And you open this, this, so you can't see the altar. Mm -hmm. And then at one point of the service, they open it up so that you can see the altar. So then and all this stuff is behind there. So this is the altar, and this is the altar piece behind it. But then there's icons, one, you know, all lining all these things. That's icons, and icons are pictures of biblical scenes or pictures of the saints, you know, and um, so that they're devotional pictures, basically, is what they are. These things are seraphim. They're meant to represent the angels that were in the throne room of God that Isaiah saw. So that, uh, you know, when Isaiah saw them, um, they had six wings and they were flying and, and saying, holy, 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 and so forth. That's what these are meant to represent. Okay? Um, so everything in 
and I, and I couldn't tell you in detail what's, what each thing is, but uh, these are seraphim. Some of these things are um, monstrances, okay, which basically are things to hold the communion host up so that you could see it rather than to have it in a plate. Okay, and other relics and things like that. Yeah, they hold it up like that so that you can see it um, until they're ready to use it, that kind of stuff. So they're all basically things to display various things necessary for worship. Um, signs and symbols. Pardon me? Signs and, signs and symbols. symbols. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, you know, in Orthodox churches and in classic old world like Catholic churches where there's a lot of stuff there, um, and not so much in our church, but in a lot of old, old style churches, um, part of the point of a lot of these churches is so that people will do exactly what you did. People will look and say, what does that mean? Yeah. You know, a good Lutheran question. What's that mean? What's that all about? What's that doing there? And they'll ask, and then they can learn. From, that's what stained glass is for. You know, what's, you know, what, who are those people with that woman riding that donkey, and why are they crossing that river? Oh, that's Mary and Joseph going down to Egypt. You know, with, and then you can tell the story. It just, uh, and this is in, it was in contrast in my mind to some of the churches you showed us from India. How simple. <laughs> yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Maybe a cross, maybe it just barely. It just, it just, this is so, uh, has a lot of stuff. It's a very ornate, and, and that's true. And some of the difference, uh, you know, I hate, I hate to say it this way, but it is true. Um, some of the difference is uh, depending on how much money the people of the congregation have, mm -hmm. you know. And it's it's generally true that way. But sure. you know, some of those little tiny churches in India, India, the people of the church don't have a lot of money, so you get just enough money together to put a garland over the thing, and that's about all you can you can manage. Here, probably you have um, people with money, and they're like, uh, okay, you know. There's a candlestick on the altar that was in memory of her yaya. I'm going to put a <laughs> candlestick on the altar in memory of my yaya, you know, and that's the way it goes. Or, you know, there's all icons around the back because there was an icon in memory of his grandpa, and I'm putting one in memory of my grandpa. That's how it goes. If you've been in even Lutheran churches like that, you know, where there are brass plaques in memory of this one and that one and that one, that's how it goes. Okay. We tend to try to not be as ornate with stuff, but that's kind of how it is. Okay. Um. But yeah, the, all those things, uh, a lot of them are uh, uh, things are candlesticks, candle holders, you know, holders for other things, like I said, monstrances um, for, commu uh, for uh, the communion wafer, whatever. Um, the seraphim are up there. They're, they're on a staff that you can use for processional things, etc. Um, yeah. So anyway. That's the deal. Alright. Alright. Um, let's talk about this uh, worksheet that you have. I'll leave this wonderful picture up here. Um, so... I find it interesting that you think those are fun. <laughs> that this is fun? <laughs> compared, well, to the, compared to the airbrush pictures, you said those were kind of fun. <laughs> well, the airbrush pictures are just tacky. I mean, these are more fun. Now, the airbrush pictures are just tacky, Pam. I, just, I have to tell you. They're just... They are. I just find him tacky, and uh, we'll just put that guy up instead. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather look at one of the fun pictures. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll put this one. Is that better? 
Okay, they're just angels with their stadium horns, and they'll be fine. Stadium horns. Clip What was that? Looks like, she said it looks like the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> we'll find one we Obviously like. Obviously, people in this room don't appreciate fine art. <laughs> okay, we'll put this one up here. God at the concession stand handing out the steak. <laughs> Dollar hot dog night. Dollar hot dog night. <laughs> Dollar hot dog night. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. for two bucks you get a boomerang. He's gonna say two dollar beer night. Two dollar beer. Two dollar beer night. <laughs> okay, for those of you watching on YouTube. <laughs> oh. What can I tell you? It is a Lutheran church. Uh, okay. The Lamb opened the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about a half hour, brief period of time, in anticipation. Uh, of the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets, the seven angels who stand before God probably are the same seven angels who are in charge of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Probably the same seven angels, because it just is the way it works out in terms of the Greek language. The seven angels. Which ones? The ones we've already met in chapters 2 and 3. Okay. Um, but, I, you know, I did a look in terms of are they... Are they are they in the same order? You know, so is the, the angel in the church in Ephesus was the first one. You know, the first letter was the first to Ephesus. So is he the one who blows the first trumpet? So when I kind of matched them up, you know, letter number one, letter number two, number three, trumpet one, two, three, it was hard to tell whether there was any kind of correlation. So I thought, you know, I worked on that for about 20 minutes and thought, nah, there's no point in wasting time trying to figure out this. So... You know, just go with the idea that it seems to be the same seven angels in whatever order they show up at the trumpets. Okay, and then as I've been saying, the trumpets are not uh, melodic instruments. In the ancient days, when they wanted to play melodies, they used harps and lyres. Okay, trumpets were just those noise-making things like stadium trumpets, like I've been saying. You know, that's all they could do was to blast things for fanfares or like bugles even. Okay. Um, and then uh, three through five is uh, the sermon this morning. Another angel had a golden censer. Uh, that's the thing that we saw the guy swinging there. Came and stood at the altar, was given much incense with the prayers of God's people. Um, on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up from, before God from the angel's hand. He took the censer, filled it with fire, etc., etc. Um, just the one comment here is, is uh, what we do while we stand and worship from last chapter, what we do while we stand and worship is, is pray. Okay, and there, there seems to be this notion these days that uh, among evangelical Christians is that we have to do something more than pray. We have to do some kind of political action. We have to do social justice. We have to do trips. We have to do, you know, work. We have to do something. But there doesn't seem to be any indication of that in Revelation, that this is what we're doing while the world is falling down around us. What it says that we do while we stand and worship is pray. So it's worship, a stand, and pray. And that's what it calls for. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do acts of mercy for, for other people. But um, I think that it does mean that maybe there are times when sometimes those things get overemphasized, and maybe the political action part is too much. Um, you know, that's that's this world stuff. But other world stuff, you know, we we talk a lot about you know we ought to do protests and we ought to do write our congressman and so forth. Well, I guess that's okay. 
well, whatever happened to prayer? You know, and, and sometimes people are, yeah, I want to pray, but I want to do something. Well, pray. That's something. Well, yeah, but, you know, I mean, that's kind of how the conversation seems to go. Does that strike you that way sometimes? I want to do something more than pray. <clears throat> I, I don't understand what more can you do. Pray is what God wants us to do. Yeah. Anyhow, that's just a note. Um, the peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquake. That's I have Exodus 19 there. That's at Mount Sinai. That's what it looked like when they got to Mount Sinai. Seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Um, and, I'm, and I have a note off to the right there. Uh, the sequence of destruction in verses 7 through 12. Vegetation on land, the sea and its creatures, freshwater sources, celestial bodies, along with night and day. You can compare that with the sequence of creation in Genesis 1. It's not exactly the same sequence, but it's creation stuff, okay? I mean... Vegetation on land, sea and its creatures, fresh water, celestial bodies are all going to be affected or destroyed partially by this sequence of destructive stuff. In Genesis, you had, you know, let there be light, let there be, you know, division between land and water, let there be vegetation, let there be, you know. So what you're having is what God created is now being damaged by these Thing. So what's going on is God's creation itself is suffering. Okay? And that's where Romans 8, 18 to 22 are. If somebody <coughs> could look up those verses, that would be helpful at this time. Romans 8, 18 to 22. <coughs> if somebody could find that and read it, that would be real helpful. We consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us, where the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, the whole creation is groaning in pain and suffering, okay? And the creation has been waiting for something to happen. <clears throat> the redemption of the children of God. So it's not like <clears throat> you know, it's not like this is unusual. Um, uh, you know, God created everything and it was good, and even after the fall it stayed good. No, it's been in turmoil and groaning. All right. <clears throat> so somebody read verse 7 then, please, of uh, Revelation 8. This is the first trumpet. First angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Yeah, okay. So, big portions of the vegetation. Of, on the other hand, it says a third. Okay, so not all of it. Not the whole earth all at once, just, just part of it. Okay. Just part of it. We well, all agree to that. Okay. How about verse 8 and 9? Somebody read that, please. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures that in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. 
Okay. Um, thanks. Now, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to say that this is a direct reference to this, but it talks about a mountain being thrown into the sea, something like a mountain being thrown into the sea, and ships being destroyed, and people dying, and sea turned into blood, and so forth. Um, one of the things that we don't, we don't tend to put these things together. We don't tend to put the Bible, the stuff we know from the Bible, together with the stuff that we know from other things. Okay? For instance, um, you know, it, it's real. St. John, we know, we know that St. John lived for most of the first century A.D., Okay, from, let's say, from almost all the way to A.D. 100. Okay, well, in 64 A.D., Rome burned. Big portions of it burned, and Nero blamed the Christians. Well, St. John was alive when that happened. So word got to him, <laughs> somehow, that that happened. So he knew about it. He must have known about it. In 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies. Wherever John was, he must have heard about it. Okay. In 79 A.D., Mount Vesuvius exploded and obliterated the city of Pompeii. Now, we know about that from world history or from Latin class or from tourist brochures or something, you've heard about Pompeii or from Nat Geo Channel or something, but somehow we never kind of combine the two and say, Pompeii was 79 A.D., St. John lived until almost 100 A.D. Do you suppose that St. John would have heard about the explosion of Vesuvius and the destruction of Pompeii? I bet he did. And so when he writes here in Revelation, something like a mountain was thrown into the sea and ships all around were de destroyed and people died and so forth. I bet that's, you know, I bet that was on his mind. It might not be a direct reference, but I bet that was on his mind. So here's some Google images of Pompeii that we've they've uncovered since then. Pompeii is, was missing for 1,500 years. There were some, play, you know, there was a point in, history where people didn't even believe Pompeii ever existed, except in the letters of, you know, ancient Romans who were writing, oh, this is what we had, what we did, how we rescued people from Pompeii, we sent ships in, and so forth, and they thought that was all make-believe for a long time. As one of the Roman statesmen, Pliny, was writing to his, Pliny the Younger was writing to his uncle, Pliny the Elder, who helped rescue a lot of people from Pompeii with the Roman Navy. There's the Navy for you. Okay. But, but, um, um, you know, um, but people thought that that was all a fiction for a long time until they started digging and they discovered this stuff and now it's vastly restored. It's one of the best restored archaeological sites ever. Cleaned up. Um, lots of, um, Frescoes, um, uh, not frescoes, mosaics, stuff like that. Um, you can see where people, um, you know, where the ash, frescoes like this one, places where the ashes just covered people and entombed their bodies right where they fell, and they're still there. Um, frescoes, everything just to, you know. So did St. John have that in mind when he was writing? Maybe. It was in the back of his mind. Is this a direct reference to it? I don't know. But he did know about that. So I, I guess this is one of these indications where we have, I think we have to say, you know what, guys, we need, to, we need to pull, you know. Certainly, I think when Jesus was preaching, some of the parables he talked about were references to stuff he saw about or he saw going on. I, I, we, we're pretty sure of that. I mean, you know, there's a point in one of the Gospels where um, people come to him and say, um, did you hear about those Galileans who 
died, you know, who Pilate killed when they were bringing sacrifices. You know, are, were they worse sinners than the ones who weren't killed? And Jesus said, no, that's the wrong question. Don't ask that question. The question is, when you hear that kind of story, how's your relationship with God? Do you need to repent of something before something bad happens to you? And then Jesus goes on to say, how about that story about the tower that fell in Siloam and killed a bunch of people? You know, were they worse sinners than the ones who survived? That's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, how is your relationship to God? Is there something you need to repent before something worse happens to you? That's the right question to ask. So we know that Jesus made reference to current events of his day, even though we have no idea what the Tower of Siloam was all about. So we need to be able to look at something like Revelation or anything in the Bible and say, are there things in the current events of that day that, you know, that are possible reference? John isn't just pulling this stuff out of thin air. I don't think. I think there are things he's making reference to, and this could well be one of them. A mountain falling into the sea. Well, that's certainly, you know, if you've ever been to Mount St. Helens, you know, or if you saw the pictures of Mount St. Helens, <laughs> you know, there's a big part of that mountain that's missing. You know, and uh, certainly the descriptions of the people in the ancient world as to what happened to Pompeii, you know, I think, I think John's right on track here. Now, what John is saying is that what the Romans, like Pliny, the, uh, the younger and elder, thought was going on was the mountain was blowing its top and we have to rescue a lot of people. What John is saying is that an angel was blowing his trumpet and that set this whole thing in motion. So John is saying there's a behind-the-scenes thing going on. And there's a reason this is happening. It's not just a random event, and it has nothing to do with the god of volcanoes being upset. Okay, and we'll get to why in a minute, but this is what John is trying to say. There's nothing, it has nothing to do with the god of volcanoes, and it has nothing to do with random events. There's a different reason for this. Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute. Whatever it is. So let's go to uh, verse 10 and 11. Somebody read those. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of this star is Wormwood. A third of the water, waters turned bitter. And many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, the name of the star is Wormwood, and uh, this the note here says this is the only place this word appears in the New Testament. But if you look outside the Bible, it's you can find it outside the Bible, and the Greek word refers to a plant that you can grow in your garden. It's the plant uh, from which you get absinthe, the liquor absinthe which you can only really get in Europe <laughs> because it's illegal in the United States. And the all-inclusive resorts. And the all-inclusive <laughs> resorts. The special <laughs> shots. Yeah, special shots. Ask Brian about that one. All right, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm not, I was, gonna, I was about to say, I'm not going to ask you how you knew that any more than you shouldn't ask Somebody me how I know about dwarf incense. So. Yeah. <laughs> the head shop. No. <laughs> Isn't there something about the wormwood? That's in a hymn. Oh, the wormwood and the gall. Yes, that's in there. Apparently, absinthe is used for flavoring and vermouth as well, according to this. But that I don't know anyway. Uh, actually, gall is bitter. Gall is bitter stuff, but the whole idea is it's bitter. Um, the German word for absinthe is vermouth. 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 Yeah, apparently. So. You know, I, I, I know nothing about any of this stuff, but, <laughs> other than what I read. Manhattan. <laughs> but there is a liqueur in Europe that is absinthe, and it's you can you can actually see people drinking it in um, paintings <laughs> by, by Vincent Van Gogh. 
but it, it says, you know, it's very bitter, ingested in large amounts, it causes convulsions and kidney, kidney failure. So mm -hmm. the whole point of this is it's very poisonous, very toxic, and when the star falls into the waters, people die from it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, hence that picture that I had there, people drank the waters and they, they, they died. Okay. Um, all right, uh, verse 12. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and the third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Okay, thanks. And so that's creation also, right? We create and let there be light, and then there was put the stars in the heavens, all those kind of things. So um, that's about the creation. So uh, these things, the trumpets so far, are about the things that God has created. Um, when we get into chapter 9, we're going to... Uh, these things are about taking out one-third of everything that God has created, just destroying it. When we get into chapter 9, all of a sudden, things are going to change, and hell itself is going to open up, and really nasty stuff is going to come up out of the depths of hell. Uh, but that's chapter 9, so we can save that for next week. That's for something for you to look forward to. <laughs> um, but let's read verse 13. Somebody read that. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Okay, and just a couple of notes here. First of all, uh, an eagle, um, not because he's a, such a majestic bird here, but because he's a carrion bird. You know, eagles, eagles ate carrion as well as whatever. So maybe a vulture would be a better translation, but the word is eagle. But And then the three woes are he proclaims are fulfilled in those verses. So later on, and we'll actually say in 9 verse 12, this first woe is fulfilled, there are two more yet. And then in 11.14, the second wall was now fulfilled and so forth. And then the third one is kind of difficult to track down, but I think it's, um, you know, woe to Babylon and so forth, so the woes. And actually, I've said this before, I can remember it. The Hebrew word for woe is oi. Oi. Oi, oi, oi. So I imagine an eagle flying around going, oi, oi, oi. <laughs> Yeah. 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 If you heard an eagle going, oh, yo, yo, I think you'd better be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. And when the other three angels sound it, then, uh, you know, it really is going to be, oh, yo, yo, because the, because the next three trumpets are going to bring out things that are come, going to come from the depths of hell itself. And it's going to be really nasty. You thought this was bad. You ain't seen nothing yet. Mm -hmm. But the point is, and I put this in this box off to the right, the key to understanding the purpose of these plagues is at the end of Revelation 9, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So the point of the trumpets, the angels with the trumpets, is to move people to repentance. That's the point. Right? I got a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Is the church still around when these trumpets are being blown off? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. Um, and my answer is going to be yes, the church is still around because this is going to be, um, this is during the entire time from when Jesus ascended into heaven until he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So, so this is, yes, so, um, this is now, 
This is now. <laughs> so I guess I guess I will I guess I want to say it this way. I think there are some people who would say that the angels the angels blow trumpets in turn one after another. Um, I'm going to say I don't know that that's the case. I'm going to say that as we go throughout history, we might be able to point to one and say, oh look, Mount Vesuvius. That looks like a second angel event. Oh look, um, waters turn bitter. That's a, some kind of ecological disaster. That might be a third angel event. Okay, but I think as we go throughout history, I don't know that it's going to be possible to say. You know, these centuries are first angel. These centuries are second angel. These centuries are third angel in sequence like that. I think it's much more likely that we might be able to look at a particular event and say. That's a first angel event. That's a second angel event. That's a fourth angel event. That's a seventh angel event. That's a sixth angel event. We could do something like that, uh, maybe. But I think, uh, I think that's more likely what we've got in this whole time, in this whole age between when Jesus ascended till he comes again, is that, is that all the angels are active, all these things are happening all at the same time. And that the best we can do is to point to one or another and say, that looks like a fifth angel event. But I'd hesitate even to nail that one down for the same reason that I hesitate to nail down uh, the Antichrist. Because I think what will happen is when Jesus comes again and, he's, and, and, and we say, was that a fifth angel event? He'll say, no, that wasn't in a fifth angel event. Oh, it was something else entirely. And we'll go, oh, okay. Okay. So I really hesitate to nail something down entirely like that. But the best I can say at this point is to say all these activities and actions and horrible things that are happening have been happening since Jesus ascended and will continue to happen until he comes again to take us into heaven. So, yes, this whole age of the church when we're here, it's all going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, is I mean, just these four natural, these four things that look like natural things. I mean, anytime there's a natural disaster, could we say, you know, is and, and I think maybe that's and, and I think the point is to say, okay, if there is a natural, the point of this, these two chapters in Revelation is to say. If there is such an event, like say an ecological disaster, okay, so if the wormwood thing is, and we should say there's an ecological disaster, and that looks like a third angel event, then if that's the case, then what do you do with that, personally? And what John and the angels want to do is to say, then use that as, a, as an occasion to repent. Okay. Just like Jesus said, when you hear news of something like the Tower of Siloam fell, don't say, were the ones who died worse sinners than the ones who survived. Use that as, as an occasion to say, how does my relationship look with God look right now? Is there something I need to repent? Is there some part of my act that I need to get cleaned up with God? Okay. That's what matters. Okay. That's what we ought to do with that. So if you look at this, and you know, if you go and watch, you know, hear about something like you know, an inconvenient sequel, you know, or the inconvenient truth, or whatever, who cares if it's a, you know, in some one respect, who cares if it's an ecological disaster? What does it have to say about your personal relationship with the heavenly Father? Is there something you need to repent of? 
And if so, then we got a remedy for that in there. All right? If, you know, if not, then A, are you being honest with yourself? And B, if you're not being honest with yourself, then get honest with yourself. Okay, I mean Which, which reminds me of a number of years ago when New Orleans got hit by the uh -huh. hurricane. There mm -hmm. were a number of churches that were saying they, they, they deserved it, mm -hmm. but basically what they were judging them, and they shouldn't yeah. be judging them. Right. Judge right. Your, you know, look at yourself. That's what I'm getting from your... Right, right. Look I, at I, yourself, I, don't worry about... Right, I think that's always... Don't worry about your brother or sister. Or yeah, I think, that's, right. I, I think that's always a difficult thing to do. Um, that's always a difficult thing to do. I think... I think... It, I think there's biblical reason to say that that's always a difficult thing to do. I think one, one is that uh, Jesus, there were st some indications why Jesus didn't want to do it. You know, say that, that's not the way to do it. Um, um, I think that's part of the issue. I think it's a big part of the issue and the discussion in the whole book of Job. Um, you know, if you read through the book of Job, which is difficult to ferret it out because it's so... You know, there's so much in there, and it's so poetic. But um, um, Job has a lot, and everything he has is taken away from him in, in like two chapters. And then his three friends come over, and they spend most of the rest of the book trying to convince him that there were reasons why this stuff happened to him. And, and, all the reason, and it, it was all his fault. For whatever reason, and none of it was Job's fault, and we know that in the book because uh, it tells us. But you know they're trying to reason it out, and and by the end of the book of Job, um, you know, basically God says sometimes things happen that you cannot tell what the reason is. You just don't know. So to try to figure out the reason is an act in futility. Don't do it. You know, so I think there's some biblical reasons why we need to say, you know what, Lord? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or as Jesus would say, how's your relationship with the Lord going these days? What's it look like? And, and don't point fingers at somebody else and judge somebody else. So that comes at the end of the next chapter. All right, anything else? We're doing okay? Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I didn't ask you how your week was. How was your week? 